welcome you to the 2020 Fall Franciscan Zoom Lecture, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Bishop John Stowe, a conventual Franciscan, has been the Bishop on Lexington, Kentucky since 2015. The Lexington Diocese consists of 50 counties in central and eastern Kentucky. 40 of those counties are in the Appalachian region of the country. Bishop John received his Master's of Divinity and licensure at, in sacred theology from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley and was very happy to live with the Franciscan community at FST at that time and was deeply influenced by the friars there. He spent 15 years of his priesthood working in parishes in the Diocese of El Paso on the US-Mexico border and served as Vicar General of that diocese for seven of those years. In 2010, he was elected Vicar Provincial of the Conventual Franciscan Province of Our Lady of Consolation and also became Rector of the Basilica and National Shrine of Our Lady of Consolation in Cary, Ohio, until his appointment as Bishop of Lexington by Pope Francis. I welcome Bishop John. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to do something for FST. I'm happy to see so many people are interested in the series that you're doing. When I was introduced to my diocese, or I should say, when I had introduced myself to the Diocese of Lexington for the first time, I presented myself as a Franciscan, educated by Jesuits, appointed, appointed bishop by a Jesuit pope named Francis. And I think all of those elements have been foundational for my understanding of church and my understanding of my ministry. I also said at the time of my installation that I will always be a Franciscan. It's very often asked of me, how is it that a Franciscan becomes a bishop? Well, that, that's a mystery I don't understand. I just responded to an invitation. But how, do, how is a Franciscan bishop different and I would have to say it was because of the school of spirituality in which I was nurtured, in which I was formed. And that is a spirit of fraternity that I think as a Franciscan bishop, I strive to spread through the diocese. It gives us a different lens at looking at the church. And I think we try to look at the church the way that Francis of Assisi did as well. That is an institution that constantly has to have new life breathed into it and at times needs to be rebuilt. In 2013, when Pope Francis was elected, and I was still working in Cary, Ohio, I rushed home from an ecumenical gathering, an ecumenical uh, outreach program at the local Methodist church to see who was going to step out on the balcony of St. Peter. And I knew very little but something about Jorge Bergoglio when he first stepped out on, on the balcony and watched his wonderful way of interacting with the people who were there, asking for their prayers over him before he gave his blessing, and saying to the people that they had gone to the ends of the earth to find a bishop for Rome. When we had heard that he took the name Francis, of course, my local Franciscan community was overjoyed, and the first words that came to me at that moment were, rebuild my church words that the crucified Lord spoke to Francis of Assisi some 800 years earlier. Pope Francis has not disappointed at all. And with his great Jesuit background, formation and spirituality, I think he is at heart very Franciscan and his words, his writing, and more importantly, his way of being, I think conveys that to the church. The topic for this uh, lecture is Elements of Franciscan Spirituality for the Renewal of the Church, building on those words that St. Francis heard from the crucified Christ in the falling down church of San Damiano in Italy. Now it might be strange to talk about Roy, and I apologize for the typo on there, Francis' Brother of the Universe was written by Roy Gasnick, there is no L in his name, at the time when the Franciscan family was preparing for the 800th anniversary of Francis, so he wrote Francis Brother of the Universe around 1980. And he wrote Francis Brother of the Universe as a comic book, and it was published by Marvel Comics, presenting a different kind of superhero, a man who sought out humility, a man who experienced poverty and embraced poverty, 
and a man who became brother truly to the entire universe. I mention him in light of this because at the same time that he produced the comic book, he also produced an issue of Catholic Update, something that the St. Anthony Messenger Press, a ministry of the Franciscans of the Cincinnati province, um, something that the St. Anthony Messenger Press provides as bulletin inserts for parishes, giving some updates on theology and issues of the church. In 1980, in preparation for the then upcoming 800th anniversary of the birth of Francis, he wrote, Roy, Glass, Roy Gasnick wrote about elements of St. Francis that could be helpful for rebuilding the church. I'm not taking his text by any means, but he provided six categories that I will use in the course of this lecture, and I think they were very complete at the time, so I borrow those from him. What I'm saying is really influenced very much by the election of Pope Francis, and especially as Pope Francis described to the journalists shortly after his election, why it was that he chose that name. You might remember the story that as the cardinals in the conclave were kind of counting out loud, and I think about it like little kids cheering an election as they were counting the votes, and once he had reached the required number of votes, and there were still more to be counted, uh, Cardinal Claudio Humis, a Franciscan from Sao Paulo, Brazil, reached over and touched his arm and says, don't forget the poor. And it was at that moment Francis said that the name Francis came to him, and so that was the name he took as Pope. So thinking about the elements of Franciscan spirituality go back to the saint of Assisi, as well as the way they are incarnated by the Pope who bears his name eight centuries later. A lot has happened since 1980 when Roy Gasnick produced the comic strip, or 1982, and we celebrated the 800th birthday of St. Francis. A lot has happened even since the election of Pope Francis. But I think everyone would agree that in the early 21st century, there is need for renewal in the church. We can lament the number of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those who profess no religion at all. We can lament the number of inactive or former Catholics um, who have left the church for one reason or another. We can see a lot of indifference towards the practice of organized religion. And we can see that the institution doesn't necessarily speak to everybody, despite its power to save and its power to transform the world. I think just as in the 13th century, the personal conversion journey of Francis of Assisi, the little poor man, had an impact much larger than himself. I think the Franciscan family, the Franciscan movement, and certainly a Jesuit pope who's taken the name Francis, has a lot to offer the church is renewal in this time, in this moment in history. The slide mentions some of the things that are come to mind immediately when we think about the church in the 21st century. The widespread issue of sexual abuse of children by clergy in the church and the parallel scandal of the cover-up of that abuse and the desire to keep it hidden rather than confront it head-on. I think it has expanded even in Pope Francis's mind, it was larger than he ever knew it was. And even though since 2002, we've made great strides at transforming that situation and preventing abuse from the future, we're still paying dearly, but not nearly as much as those who experienced abuse by someone that they trusted and somebody that represented Christ and his church to them. Largely because of that sexual abuse issue, but not exclusively because of that issue, there's so much loss of trust in the institutional church. Part of it is just our, the time period in which we live in society. The great divisions that happen in society that are exacerbated now as we are two months away today from a presidential election that seems to highlight those great divisions that we experience. But it's not unique to the United States. We find those great divisions happening all over the world and sadly finding their way into the church as well. It's not uncommon, although we don't talk about red and blue churches or red and blue dioceses, we certainly do talk about liberal and conservative forces in the church, even though they're not usually very good descriptors of what happens within the church. It's impossible to overlook climate change, although some still, some few still live in denial, but climate change as a major factor affecting the whole universe 
and certainly what our young people would like to see the church and any institution that is going to have credibility um, address in a productive and creative way. And of course, the pandemic is something that unprecedented, at least in this, in the last hundred years, and something that um, we currently are struggling through and finding new ways to adapt to. So just a snapshot of the church at this moment, and particularly in the 21st century, I don't think any would, ar would argue that it is not in need of renewal. I think with a little understanding of history, we'll see that that is always the case. And because institutions are formed by great charismatic leaders, there is need repeatedly in history for new charismatic leaders to come along and for new life to be breathed into the institutions. Back in 1980, Roy Gasnick asked the question, and I would ask it again for us today, what does Francis of Assisi have to teach us? What can he contribute in this moment of history that could be a value as we strive for a renewal of the church? There are many ways of reading the multiple lives of Francis of Assisi written uh, shortly after his own lifetime and right up until the present moment. There are many common factors in those lives. There are some other novel pieces in one or the other author. But one of the things that speaks to me very much in the life of Francis, and I think it has a real contemporary application, is that the story of Francis is a story of conversion. And not exactly like the great conversion of St. Paul on the road to Tarsus, where one moment changes everything, and he who once persecuted the Christians is now the great leader of the Christians. In Francis's life, there were multiple moments of conversion. I think even a lifelong process of conversion. And I think Francis would admit that himself. Although the biographers talk about the moment that he left the world, the way that Thomas of Chilano describes his conversion, there are multiple moments, there are several experiences that feed into this experience, this larger experience of conversion. If you're at all familiar with the life of Francis, you probably recognize some of these events. These are three that I think are key. There are certainly more that could also be added to the list. Francis himself describes his repulsion by the sight of lepers. The leper who had to ring a bell and announce his coming or her coming from across the road so that everyone else would get out of the way. The fear of the contagion of this disease. The, the physical consequences of the disease of leprosy that would cause a leper to almost die in pieces. And Francis himself talks about how revolting he found the sight and the smell of lepers. He talks about the time that as he was riding along on his horse before his conversion, he would say, um, he was always generous to lepers. He did have sympathy, he had pity for them, and would toss a coin from a distance, but was repulsed at the sight, and even in this moment wanted to take the horse in the opposite direction. But something larger than himself moved him towards the leper, moved him to get off his horse, and instead of toss a coin, actually place the coin in his hand. Layers of taboo being crossed in that moment and Francis experiencing the humanity of this person and maybe awakening a sense of how he saw himself as a sinful human being, as a person who was dying in pieces, as a person that might be repulsive to others but is loved by Christ. That's one of the moments that changes his life forever. And if he was at one time repulsed by the sight and smell of lepers, he then goes on to minister to them, washing their wounds, and describes a joy that he hadn't experienced in his early life, despite his easy access to cash, his easy uh, access to all of the finer things in life. It was very close to that time where Francis was wandering around trying to find himself. I think this is also an experience that speaks to contemporary people, perhaps especially the youth. I've heard someone refer to Francis as the first to experience prolonged adolescence. After his miserable attempt at being a soldier and his time as a prisoner of war, he's freed, but not with any clear idea what he's supposed to do, just with no zest, no zeal for the life he lived before. 
and he went around wandering, trying to explore what it is that he should do. Like he found comfort serving the lepers, he found comfort in abandoned churches, and the day that the San Damiano crucifix spoke to him, he heard very clearly the words to rebuild the church, which he saw was falling in ruins. Those words would come back throughout his life to mean more than just the rebuilding, literally, of that space, which became the first home for the poor Clare nuns, but it became something that he was offering to the institutional church. It was much later in his life when we have the story of his being marked with the wounds of Christ in the stigmata. I think that's part of the, the story of conversion, where in a physical way he begins to experience what Christ experienced on the cross. Francis fell in love with this loving Christ who would forgive him, and that forgiveness that he experienced from Christ, the mercy that he experienced from Christ, was so overflowing in him that he had to share it with everybody. And thus begins his ministry of evangelization. Conversion is what he was seeking, trying to find his own path in life. And once he found Christ, once he encountered Christ, words that are very familiar and very beloved by Pope Francis, the encounter, he was so overjoyed by that encounter that he had to share it with others. And thus is born his desire to go out of himself and evangelize. The first of the categories that Gasnick uses for the renewal of the church is start by renewing yourself. And I think that is just as applicable today as it ever was. It's easy to complain about the institution. It's easy to point out its flaws. It's easy to um, complain about what isn't happening. It's sometimes harder to recognize if I truly believe that through baptism and through my life as a member of the body of Christ, that institution is part of me just as I am part of it, then if the church is to be renewed, I'm going to need to be renewed. That was indeed the experience of Francis. He didn't set out to create an order. He didn't set out to transform the church. He didn't set out to convert the world. He set out to discover himself. And in the discovery, in the renewal, where he sheds and strips himself of all the earthly things that he discovered did not bring him the pleasure that he sought or the happiness that he sought, the more that he emptied himself, like Christ who emptied himself to become one of us, he experienced a joy that he had to share. He never thought he would be starting a movement. In fact, his famous words about the fact that he drew attention to himself and followers he said, the Lord gave me brothers and didn't tell me what to do. It would take a, lot, a while for him to figure out what to do, but he found the gospel as his guide, and he wasn't afraid to fumble along trying to figure it out along the way. The life of Francis is appealing because it is a story of lifelong conversion, a process, a journey. He wasn't given a map. He wasn't given a blueprint. He didn't discover a plan and then put it into to practice. He discovered day by day, by openness to prayer, by a continuous emptying of himself, and by accepting as gift those that the Lord placed in his life. At this moment in the times when the church needs renewal, we might begin by asking ourselves how much of what we don't like about the institution have we internalized ourselves, ourselves. That is, it's somebody else's job to do or the structure, or whatever it is. As living cells in the body of Christ, we start by renewing ourselves. Francis' experience, again, on the road of discovery, was to create caring communities. Recently, the Franciscan scholars are rediscovering the importance of the word fraternity in the writings of Francis. We kind of used for a time community and fraternity as interchangeable. But for Francis, fraternity is important because it literally means brotherhood. We would say brotherhood and sisterhood today. The importance of fraternity, we're in this together, we're related together. And for Francis, that's a Christological reality. He honored Mary, the mother of Jesus, as she who gave the Lord of heaven to us as a brother. He marveled at the idea that God could become our brother. And what does God as our brother teach us but that we are brothers and sisters to each other? We are social beings. We're not in this alone, and we can't survive alone. 
We need each other and are connected to each other. But when we use the words of fraternity, and certainly the familial connections with fraternity, it's important to remember that we choose friends, we choose companions, we choose partners, but we don't choose our brothers and sisters. And if we really live as brothers and sisters, it's not just with the selective ones that we would like to have community with, but a fraternity that has to be increasingly inclusive. I think that's something the church has to learn again and again throughout its history. If we are to live as brothers and sisters, we have to be more and more inclusive, not separating people out, labeling them, castigating them, or excluding them, but recognize that we are in this together. Francis had an experience of fraternity with lepers and beggars even before his own brothers joined him and became faithful companions. And in the course of his life and in the course of his ministry, in the course of this long process of conversion, Francis is able to expand his sense of fraternity to all creation, to all creation, as he expresses in his beautiful and well-known canticle of Brother Son, something we're rediscovering now as part of our, our, our need to be attentive to our common home, as Pope Francis calls it, the beauty of creation. For both Francis's, for Francis of Assisi and Pope Francis, the renewal of the church and any kind of faithful Christianity has to include compassion for the poor, for the outcasts and the oppressed. Pope Francis has lamented what he calls the globalization of intolerance and the globalization of a hardening of heart, the globalization of indifference. And he contrasts that in his writings to what he calls the revolution of tenderness. Francis of Assisi experienced that revolution of tenderness, moving in his conversion process from a life oriented towards a military career to a life oriented towards creating fraternity, a gentleness with which he called all of creation to renewal. From the beginning of his pontificate in 2013, France, Pope Francis has constantly called us to what he refers to as the peripheries. Maybe in English, the word margins is more comfortable or more familiar to us. He helps us to see that there are voices crying out to us that truly are the presence of Christ in our world today. And our conversion can't be complete unless we are engaged with those voices. When we talk about the globalization of indifference, Pope Francis would lament the fact that a point change on the stock market makes news, but lives of the shipwrecked at Lampedusa, the island between Italy and Africa, um, was completely unknown, despite the fact that so many lives were lost there. You might recall that Pope Francis's first trip outside of Rome as Pope was to Lampedusa, and there's a cute story that is very revealing about how Francis planned that trip. To try to make it short, he went to the current Secretary of State at the time and said that's where he wanted to go, and was given lots of reasons why it would take a long time to plan such a trip. There was no infrastructure on that island. Um, he had to be very careful about what kind of statement he was making by visiting a place like that, et cetera, et cetera. He was trying to school the Pope in what was necessary in making such a big trip. When he seemed to be dragging his feet and Francis was eager to get to this place, the story is that the Secretary of State received a call from the president of Alitalia Airlines, who interrupted him in a meeting and said that he had just sold a ticket to Lampedusa to a Jorge Bergoglio, Pope Francis's name before he became Pope. Well, of course, he didn't fly in coach class, which might have been his preference, but it certainly made that trip a reality. And when he got there, he celebrated mass made of an altar, an altar made it itself out of the shipwreck um, on which people lost their lives trying to flee from the poverty and starvation of Africa to the promise of Europe. It's where he coined the phrase, the globalization of indifference. But consistently throughout his papacy, he has called our attention to those marginal places. When he went to Brazil for a World Youth Day, he made sure to visit one of the worst favelas, one of the most 
uh, dehumanizing places of poverty within the city of Rio, a place that, according to people there, was not even on the map because they discouraged people from going there. It was so dangerous. Francis not only went there, but made himself at home there, as he constantly does. Francis was not the first pope to visit the Holy Land, but he did go in the company of a rabbi and an imam, and he is the first pope to stop along the wall that separates Israelis from Palestinians and prayed silently there in the same way that one prays at the Wailing Wall and the holy sites in Jerusalem. Again and again, Francis calls us to see what we can easily overlook, the people who are marginalized, the people on the peripheries, the people that don't have the world's attention. They need to have our attention. He's told us again and again that the church will be most authentic, the church will be most productive, the church will be most fruitful, the church will be most faithful to itself when it embraces the poor. And of course, he brings to his experience the whole experience of the Latin American church since the Second Vatican Council and its struggle to make the preferential option for the poor a reality. As Cardinal Hume said to him as he was being elected, don't forget the poor, I don't think Francis needed to be reminded of that again and again. Even when he visited this country, he made sure that he went to soup kitchens, to homeless shelters, to places where migrants are being detained, and even to jails. Reach to the peripheries. Compassion for the poor, the outcasts, and the impressed is really calling our attention to today's current unrest as we begin to understand or strive to understand systemic racism in our society. Sadly, it takes the multiple killings of African Americans by police officers to open our eyes to what we can often overlook, and that is the plight and the consequences of racism in our day. There are implications for the migration policy. We don't have to go to Lampedusa off the coast of Italy because we have our own southern border where people are being detained, where people who are seeking asylum, who are escaping life-threatening situations have been held back and not allowed in. The Church of El Paso, where I was privileged to serve for a good number of years and that really formed me as a priest, um, has in recent years demonstrated its authenticity as a church especially during the migrant crisis there, or the, what we might say, manufactured crisis at the border, when every church in El Paso was opening its doors, when all of the, even the pastoral center, the chancery of the diocese had people staying there because there was no place to put all these migrants and every parish made it their business to provide meals and to provide clothing, to provide necessities for the outcast. The church truly came alive the church is the best, is, is at its best when it demonstrates its compassion for poor, for the outcasts, and for the oppressed. Gaznik pointed out Francis is a man of peace who offered a way of peace, of nonviolence and reconciliation. Pope Francis has restored a lot of the impetus within the Vatican to not be so internally focused, but to truly reach out to the world and help negotiate a way to peace. We've seen Pope Francis bring the leaders of Israel and Palestine together to the Vatican Gardens to pray together. We've seen him bringing together warring factions from Africa and literally kiss their feet, pleading and begging them to find ways of peace. We find him continuously preaching the need for peace and showing, demonstrating how those on the peripheries, how the poor are the ones who most suffer the consequences of war and how it contributes to the situation of migration and refugees in the world today. In the life of Francis of Assisi, and just recently we celebrated the 800th anniversary of this great encounter between Francis and the Sultan in, in Damaso in Syria as a model for interreligious dialogue centuries ahead of that time. In fact, when Francis went to Damietta in Syria, it was during the Crusades, during a time when Christians took up arms against Muslims to reclaim the Holy Lands, the place of Christ, to reclaim the lands of the Prince of Peace, 
They took up arms against Muslims, but also against Orthodox Christians and Jews along the way. Francis went along, but unarmed. He forced his way to the head of the delegation and insisted on meeting the Sultan face to face. It's a beautiful encounter, once again, an encounter that did not result in martyrdom, nor did it result in conversion. Francis did not become Muslim, obviously, and the Sultan did not become Christian, but they recognized each other as men of God. They recognized each other as having the dignity of human beings. They had a mutual respect for each other that spread to their followers. Sadly, the story was lost for a long time, but once again, we can discover that it is possible when we look to each other and have a genuine encounter without trying to change the other, but can grow in respect and discover that we have more in common than we have difference. Some historians have written about the fact that the first followers of Francis, and particularly the lay followers that became the third order of St. Francis, were prohibited from carrying arms or taking oaths of fealty. Remember, this came from a person who saw his career path as one of military strength before his conversion. The rejection of arms might have something to say and might say what the church should say about today's dis battles over gun rights. For Francis, for the Franciscan tradition and for Pope Francis, peace is more than the absence of war because peace has to be based on right relationships. That's a heritage that we've inherited from Judaism. It's the concept of shalom. It's not just the Pax Romana, the peace of the Roman Empire, which you could suppress people and if they don't arise, or you can placate people and if they don't arise or rebel, you have peace. But the peace that Jesus proclaimed when he rose from the dead, the peace that he breathed upon his disciples, was one that was about restoring relationships as his victory over death did. Right relationships we're hearing on the streets throughout the United States right now. Right relationships equals justice. You've seen the signs, I'm sure, no justice, no peace, or more popularly, no justice, no peace, with the NOs. Peacemaking, more than just a love for peace in the generic sense or in a romantic sense or in a uh, spiritual sense, but real peacemaking is not easy. It involves reconciliation. It's not easy for us as individuals. It's not easy for us as families. It's certainly not easy for us as humanity. But peacemaking involves reconciliation. That involves conversion. It involves recognizing the truth. It involves repentance and making amends for what has been done wrong. And it involves creating a new path forward. Pope Francis speaks frequently about the importance of a new path forward. All the other steps are necessary, but we don't want to get stuck in any one of them. We've seen, for example, the Truth and Justice Commission in South Africa. We've seen similar um, uh, efforts in Guatemala, recognizing the pain, the suffering that has been caused, not painting over it, not just forgetting about it, recognizing it, but in order to move on and to create a path forward where this can't be done again. Francis of Assisi, the way of peace, of nonviolence and reconciliation, how the church undermines this or, or works against itself when it doesn't embrace being the peacemaker, being the promoter of nonviolence. We have too many examples of the church blessing wars or not speaking up when a war is unjust. We don't have enough examples of the church promoting reconciliation, although there are, there are certainly some very powerful examples, like the one I mentioned of the Pope kissing the feet of Africans at war, striving to make them realize the humanity of each other. You can see that these six areas are interrelated Reverence for creation has already come up in more than one place, but it is a category by itself, and one that we are beginning to appreciate the urgency of and the necessity of more and more. 
Francis's Canticle of the Sun is the inspiration for Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. When Francis wrote that encyclical, uh, the U.S. media made it sound like he was getting into the politics of global climate change. What they overlooked was that Pope Benedict XVI had already stated as a matter of record that the church believes that there is climate change. The church believes that human beings are responsible for the majority of that climate change. And in Europe, Pope Benedict was known before Pope Francis came along as the Green Pope, installing solar panels in the Vatican and doing other things to promote uh, integrated ecology. But Francis, Pope Francis, understood the, the mind and the heart more than anything of Francis of Assisi. And he finds in that poetry of the Canticle of the Sun and the web of relationships that are described, again, fraternal relationships, they're familial relationships between sun and moon and water and fire and wind and air and all things, all creatures together. And Francis, the Pope, calls us to care for our common home. St. Francis and Pope Francis recognize the interrelationship of all life, of all creation. Laudato Si is remarkable in lots of ways. It is considered the first papal encyclical to really take science seriously and um, as a tool for theology that recognizes the science. It also talks about the need for transcending national divisions because this is a worldwide problem a worldwide solution is going to be needed. It can't just be up to nations. St. Francis' understanding of poverty is really connected to his reverence for creation. If we think about the beginning, if we think about what Genesis reveals to us, that we are given so much to have dominion over or the use of, not so much ownership. The sine proprio, without anything of my own, is how Francis wanted to live his poverty, having the simple use rather than the ownership of things, much less the accumulation of things, the manufacture of things, the planned obsolescence of things so that we have to make more and don't have any place to dispose of those things. A church that speaks for reverence for creation and ties it into its spirituality Remember, our church takes bread and wine, which are the fruits of the earth and the work of human hands. It's what humanity does with the gifts that were given from God that become transformed into the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. As we give thanks, God gives us an even greater gift, the gift of his son, body, blood, soul, and, hum and humanity and divinity. Creation as an expression of God's overflowing love, God's overflowing generosity. How remarkable creation is, what does it tell us about the creator and how remarkable the creator must be. And finally, we have the joy. That was one of the characteristics of all the writing of Pope Francis. It was a characteristic of Francis, the troubadour, the one who always had a song in his heart, the one who didn't know much French but enjoyed singing in the French language, who, who loved expressing what God had filled him in this encounter with and desire to share it with everyone. The joy of the gospel. Evangelization begins with the overflowing of joy from the heart. Joy of the gospel was the first apostolic exhortation issued by Pope Francis, very Franciscan in spirit, Franciscan in the classical sense. The joy of love is the way Pope Francis describes married life, the vocation of marriage and the family life. And of course, joy is essential to the Christian life and to a religious vocation as well. Who's going to be attracted to someone who doesn't radiate joy? Francis of Assisi had drew the following despite being dressed in rags and hanging around lepers. He exuded a joy that you couldn't help but find attractive. And then Francis of Assisi has this unusual concept of joyful penance, joyful penance. I am joyful because of all that God has done for me. I willingly take on hardship and suffering. And it was the Brazilian theologian, Franciscan Leonardo Boff, that gave a, a very provocative definition of penance as the price of gentleness in the experience of Francis. Not wishing to inflict harm, 
but willing to absorb harm so as not to contribute to the suffering of others. The six characteristics say a lot about uh, Franciscan spirituality. I think they capture it. Certainly there's always more that could be said. The six characteristics also are a path forward for the church. It's a path that involves the hierarchy, the structure of the church. It's a path that involves consecrated men and women, those that we call religious. It definitely involves the laity so that we don't get into a clericalism, a class structure, an exclus exclusivity that doesn't fit in this community of brothers uh, led by the one who became our brother, God who became our brother. It celebrates our interrelatedness. As we try to imagine six months into this pandemic, what a post-COVID church in the 21st century would look like, what elements would we like to see overcome? What elements would we like to see changed? What elements can we be part of in this renewal? What is Pope Francis calling us to? What is the witness and example of St. Francis? How do we get there? How do we get there? Uh, thank you, Bishop John, for your lecture, which uncovers the beauty of the vibrant Franciscan tradition. This opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department. We gratefully are accepting any free will offering on our website of fst.edu in the Give Now section, where you can give by credit card, create a recurring donation, or our address is listed at the bottom so that you may mail in a check if you prefer. Let us give uh, Bishop John a collective applause. Hey, hey, hey. I see lots of